Hi, today I'm going to talk about Joseph Smith and Socrates, um, which sounds like, you know, a very odd combination of people to talk about, right? Because, I mean, you know, Socrates, the father of philosophy, lived in the uh, 4th and 5th century BC, ancient Greece. Um, he was put to death for supposedly for being an atheist, even though he was not an atheist. He may not have been an orthodox, Homeric, religious person, but he certainly was not an atheist. Um, and Joseph Smith, who, uh, whose views usually seem to contrast with Socrates' views, you know, fairly sharply, or Socrates' views as as we uh, find them expressed in the writings of Plato. Um, you know, for one thing, Socrates seems super skeptical, while Joseph Smith seems to ask everyone to take all kinds of extravagant claims on faith. Um, you know, Socrates seems to, uh, especially in the Euthyphro, which I regard as one of the most important platonic dialogues, Socrates seems to uh, be in the business of debunking religion, while Joseph Smith seems to be in the business of inventing new religions. So, how does it make sense to talk about them together? Especially since I myself am a Latter-day Saint. I'm not a member of the Mormon Church of Utah. I'm a member of the Reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, organized by Joseph Smith's son, Joseph III. Uh, so my views are a little different than the typical Mormon view. Um, but, you know, as, as they are popularly depicted, these two figures seem to contrast sharply. And they do contrast in some ways, but I think there is an important... Uh, there are some important parallels between the story of Socrates and the story of Joseph Smith. Um, first of all, they both believe in divine revelation. In the case of Socrates, his story begins with a divine revelation. It comes through the Delphic Oracle, the Oracle who says, you know, know thyself. Um, and uh, the oracle says to Socrates' friend that Socrates is, well, let me phrase this very carefully, there is no wiser man in Greece than Socrates. And uh, Socrates is, is surprised by this because he knows that he doesn't have any kind of special, you know, wisdom, you know. He knows that uh, he's not anyone special. He doesn't know, you know, he, he's not more wise than anyone else in Greece. So, but he's, you know, bound by being a, a good Athenian to believe what the oracle says. So, the oracle is was infamous for giving riddles. You know, the, the, the utterances of the oracle were always riddles. So, uh, he determined to try to solve the riddle of the oracle, and, uh, and in order to do that, he tried to find someone somewhere in Greece who was wise than he was. Then he could take that person to the oracle and get her to explain the riddle. The trouble is, he never could find anyone. <laughs> he never found anyone in all of Greece wiser than he was. All of the uh, supposed wise men, the sophists, the havers, havers of wisdom, you know, sophist is, is, you know, means wise man in a sense, uh, someone who has wisdom. Um, all the sophists did not in fact have wisdom. They were all fools. And uh, so we get the idea of Socratic ignorance. Socratic ignorance is the knowledge that you are ignorant, right? The great lesson of Socrates is that the world is divided into two kinds of people. People who are fools, who think that they are wise, and people who are wise because they know that they are fools. 
that that is the great lesson of Socrates. The, the humility to realize that you know you're not <laughs> you're not uh, you're not the the all knowing determiner of all things. You know? And uh, so Socrates' quest begins with divine revelation. It could be said to end in some kind of skepticism because he couldn't find anyone. In contrast, Joseph Smith's story starts with skepticism. Joseph Smith starts from the Second Great Awakening. The state of Christianity in the Second Great Awakening was that there was a great debate between the many different churches. None of them could agree on doctrine, on whose church was right. And there had to be a, one church that was right. I mean, if two churches have doctrines that contradict each other, they can't both be right. I mean, we know we we know the law of non-contradiction, something which we are not supposed to be able to call into question, at least in Joseph Smith's ideas, um, or Socrates. I think they would both be very much agreed on the importance of the law of non-contradiction. Um, and so... He, he tried to, uh, he listened to all the different preachers of the Second Great Awakening and didn't find any of them that were satisfactory. He went to the scriptures, he read the scriptures and studied the scriptures as much as he could and could not find which of the churches was right from the scriptures. Instead, he found that the different ministers of the different churches would understand the same passage of scripture so differently as to destroy any hope of determining, you know, settling the question by an appeal to the Bible. And when he came to that realization, that the Bible didn't have the answers, and that was the point at which he stepped outside of the ideals of Protestantism, which was the prevailing religion. He stepped outside the ideas of Protestantism not in the grove, but in the Bible, when he realized the Bible did not have all the answers. That was, in a sense, the, uh, the point at which Joseph Smith diverges from Protestantism. Before he receives any divine revelation, his skepticism about, the, about Sola Scriptura, about the ability of the Bible alone to answer all our questions, that is the point at which Joseph Smith diverges from Protestantism. Um, so he, he happens upon uh, James 1.5, which is the scripture that all Latter-day Saints know. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not. He decided, based on reading that, that if God would give wisdom to anyone who asks, then he ought to ask, because he didn't have... He certainly lacked wisdom. And there you see Joseph Smith's recognition that he lacked wisdom. He had what we call Socratic ignorance. The wisdom of Socratic ignorance. He had it. He, you know, he, uh, he had the wisdom of Socratic ignorance from the beginning. What Socrates finds as the conclusion of his quest, Joseph Smith begins from, and what sent Socrates on his quest in the first place, is what Joseph Smith comes to. So you see, uh, Joseph Smith is a little bit like Socrates in reverse. Socrates starts from divine revelation, and then, and then finds Socratic, uh, Socratic ignorance. Joseph Smith starts from Socratic ignorance, and finds divine revelation. And of course we have the story of the of you know the uh, theophany you know God appearing and Christ appearing to Joseph Smith in the grove experience I'm sure anyone who wants to read that should uh, read Joseph Smith tells his own story. Um, one of the things about that piece that I'm wanting to point out is the passage in which Joseph Smith in this in this paper accuses the ministers of the apostate churches of 
sophistry. He says they will use all their power of either reason or sophistry to prove the errors of the other churches, or at least to make the people think they are in error. He is accusing them of sophistry. He is accusing them of being sophists, of making the lesser appear the better cause, of uh, using false appearances to cloud reality and truth. And the subtext is, he is saying that the apostate ministers are just like the sophists of ancient Greece, and that he himself, Joseph Smith, is like Socrates. That is his point. So, I have found in... Uh, and uh, also, you know, and then, and then in the Book of Mormon, if you read the Book of Mormon, many of the many passages in the Book of Mormon are answering Platonic questions or Socratic questions. The Book of Mormon starts from defining terms. It uses recursive deductive arguments. It in fact uses the Socratic method. It's uh. It uses the same method of arguing and the same method of teaching that Christ used, because Christ himself, in the New Testament, uses the Socratic method. So I think there are a lot of very interesting parallels between Plato and the Latter-day Saint ideology, at least, at least the early, you know, the early Joseph Smith stuff. I mean, I don't really agree with all the stuff that happened by the time he gets out to Nauvoo and so forth. But uh, you know, I think I think I think uh, there's you know some important stuff. I mean, I think there's some parallels between Captain Moroni, you know, fighting a losing cause um, to support a, a government, even though the government's becoming more wicked, you know. And then there's uh, you know, and I think that's analogous to the argument in the Crito that we should obey the laws of this government if it's a legitimate government, even if we even if we don't agree with them and even if it might cost us our life. And uh you know, there's, there's some interesting stuff there. On the other hand, um there are places of course where the Latter day Saint movement sharply diverges from Plato, but it's still addressing many of the same questions. And so what I find as, you know, in my in my own life I find that Plato is excellent for finding the questions, and the Book of Mormon is excellent for finding the answers. And I think that would be, I think that is a valid and an interesting way to study the Book of Mormon. So um, that's just some, some thoughts I've had about my religion and my, you know, my thoughts on the connections between philosophy and my religion. So uh, I hope that was interesting. I'll see you guys.